All right, in this video is the continuation of section 9.3 dealing with uh, expected value, normal distribution, and odds. Now, here we're going to talk about usual values here. So, this is where we're going to pick up with section 9.3. Okay. Now, here we can define a usual value to be one that seems reasonable or expected. So here's the rule of thumb for using standard deviation to identify usual and unusual values. So here we're going to let x bar and s represent the mean and the standard deviation of a collection of numbers that can be displayed with a histogram that is symmetric and shaped like a bell. So here, if x has a z-score from negative 2 to 2, then x is considered a usual value. Now, if x has a z-score that is less than negative 2, then x is considered an unusual value. And also, if x has a z-score more than 2, then x is considered an unusual value. So, in other words, if your x is has a z-score between negative 2 and 2, it would be considered usual. If it's Excuse me. If it's less than negative 2 or greater than positive 2, then your x value is considered to be unusual. And here you have to convert your x to a z-score. And you have to know what your mean is and what the standard deviation is. The minimum usual value is going to be x bar minus 2 times s, which has a z-score equal to negative 2. And the maximum usual value is going to be x bar plus 2s, which has a z-score equal to 2. Okay. Take a look at example 37. The heights of 19-year-old males are approximately normally distributed with a mean of 69.9 inches and a standard deviation of 3.5 inches based on information from National Health Statistics reports. Is the given height of a 19-year-old male a usual or unusual measurement? So part A is 73 inches and part B is 79 inches. Okay. So, this is where we use that Z formula. Z is equal to X minus X bar, and that quantity will be divided by X, by S, to find out what the Z value is. All heights that are considered usual have a Z score from negative 2 to 2. So, in this case here, for 73, we use this formula. 73 minus 69.9, and that difference will be divided by 3.5. I'm going to clear this out. So if I do 73 minus 69.9, that'd be 3.1. And then 3.1 divided by 3.5 would give me approximately to two decimal places 0.9. We always round the Z value to two decimal places. So your Z for 73 would be approximately 0.89. And 0.89 falls between negative 2 and 2. So that means 73 inches is a usual height. Now part B, for the z-score 79 inches, we do 79 minus 69.9, and that difference will be divided by 3.5. So if I was to do 79 minus 69.9, that'd be 9.1, and that's going to be divided by, in this case, 3.5. We'll get 2.6. Now, 2.6 is bigger than 2. It's not within the range of negative 2 and 2. 2.6 is bigger than 2. That means 79 inches would be considered an unusual height. Okay. Take a look at problem number 48, parts C and D. 
The data consists of the scores 42, 58, 60, and 52. Now, this is a continuation of problem number 48. Parts uh, A and B were, get, were done when we did the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, so in this case here, we're going to do part C and D. Is 36 a usual or unusual value? Now, now you have to look at the very the last video that I went over, part one of that video, for uh, the mean and the standard deviation, how it calculated that. The mean for that data set was 53, and S, which is your standard deviation, we came up with 7. Okay, so let me pull up that slide that I did in the last video where you see that I came up with a mean of 53 and a standard deviation of 7. So now we're going to use that to help us determine whether those two numbers are usual or unusual. So in part C, we do Z is equal to X minus X bar divided by S. The X value in this case is going to be that 36 minus the mean, which is your X bar, that's 53, divided by the standard deviation, the 7. Well, if I do 36 minus 53, I'm going to get a negative 17. Negative 17 divided by 7. Now, I've already worked this out. But if you do negative 17 divided by 7 and round your answer to two decimal places, you're going to get negative 2.43. Now, your usual values fall between negative 2 and 2. And negative 2.43 is much less than, is farther to the left than negative 2 is. So here, 36 would be an unusual value. 36 is going to be unusual. Now part D is 45 a usual or unusual value? So here we're going to use that same Z formula. Z is equal to X minus X bar, all divided by S. Now this time, your X value that you're dealing with is 45. Minus the mean, that's still 53. All divided by S, which is 7. Now, if I do 45 minus 53, that's going to be negative 8. And then negative 8 divided by 7. This will end up being a negative 1.14. And negative 1.14, if you look at it, it is between negative 2 and 2. So that falls within the range of usual numbers. So that means 45 will be a usual value. 45 is usual. All right, the next thing we'll look at is, and I'll shortly talk about this one, guidelines for numerical summaries of data. Okay. Now, here are helpful guidelines relating measures of center and variability. If the histogram of the data is approximately symmetric and has the shape of a bell without outliers, then the data could be summarized with a mean and standard deviation. About 95% of the data are within two standard deviations of the mean, or the mean and MAD, that's the mean absolute deviation, about 95% of the data are within two and a half mean absolute deviations of the mean. And if a histogram of the data does not have the shape of a bell and the data do not have any outliers, then the data could be summarized with the five-number summary. If you recall that 
that deals with the minimum, the first quartile, the second quartile, or the median, then the third quartile, and the maximum value. We did talk about that before, back somewhere in Chapter 8. And if the data contains outliers, then the data could be summarized with the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles. The 50th percentile, which is the median, is the measure of center, and the 25th and 75th percentiles provide a measure of the variation of the middle 50% of the data. We call that the inner quartile range, if you remember, or IQR, because we subtracted the third quartile minus the first quartile to get our inner quartile range. And some researchers sometimes report the 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentiles, or the 5th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 95th percentiles. All right. Now, this last thing we're going to talk about in this video will be odds in favor and odds against. Okay. Sometimes you see lottery um, tickets where they list the odds for winning. That's what we'll talk about here in this section. The probability of an event is a part to whole comparison. For example, if the probability of event E occurring is 0.24, then ideally, event E will occur 24 out of 100 times. So, the probability of event E occurring would be 24 out of 100, and the probability of E not occurring, if you recall, the complement of E, the probability of the complement of E, we do 1 minus 24 over 100, which will give you 76 over 100. Then the ratio the probability of E to the probability of not E has a simpler form of 24 over 100 to 76 over 100. Now, if you multiply both terms of the ratio by 100, you'll end up with 24 to 76. So here that ratio 24 to 76 compares the number of favorable outcomes to the number of unfavorable outcomes for E. There are 24 outcomes that favor E, and there are 76 outcomes that do not favor E. So in this example, we say the odds in favor of E are 24 to 76, and the odds in against E are going to be 76 to 24. Notice that they switch the two numbers around to get the odds against E. This is like taking the reciprocal of a fraction. Okay, Odds are more comprehensible with simpler ratios, so we should report 24 to 76 and 76 to 24 as the odds in favor of E are 6 to 19 if you reduce by dividing these two numbers by 4, and the odds against E are 19 to 6. That's just the switching of these two numbers here. So here's your uh, definition. Let E be an event with the probability of E. The odds in favor of E occurring is the ratio of the probability of event E to the probability of E not occurring. And then the odds, in, the odds against E occurring is this ratio. We just switch this around, switch this around to this, the probability of E not occurring to the probability of E occurring. Okay, take a look at problem number 41. A card is randomly drawn from a standard deck of 52 cards. What are the odds, and this is part A, in favor of drawing a 10? and part B against drawing a face card. So let's start with part A, the odds in favor of drawing a 10. Let's look at the probability of drawing a 10. There are four 10s in a deck of 52 cards, so that probability would be four over 52. 
Okay. Now this is continuing on the next slide. I'll show you that. Then that means that the probability of not drawing a 10, if there are four 10s in the deck of 52 cards, then the remaining has to be 48 out of 52. So the probability of not drawing an E, I mean drawing a 10, that's the probability of not E, 48 over 52. And then we have the following. The odds in favor of drawing a 10 is going to be this right here. Probability of event E occurring to the probability of E not occurring. So the probability of drawing a 10 would be 4 for 52 to the probability of not drawing a 10, 48 out of 52. Well, they both have 52 in the denominator, so let's multiply both terms in that ratio by 52 to get rid of it. So it be 4 to 48. And we can reduce that by dividing both terms by 4. So 4 divided by 4 will be 1, and 48 divided by 4 will be 12. This would mean that for every one chance of drawing a 10, there are 12 chances of drawing a card that is not a 10. Okay. Now, part B, there are 12 face cards in the deck, so the probability of drawing a face card is... 12 over 52. So this is dealing with the uh, odds against drawing a face card. You got 12 face cards out of 52, so that's 12 over 52. But for not drawing a face card, if there are 52 cards in the deck, let's do 12 minus 12 from 48. That'd be 40. I mean, yeah, 12 from 52, that would be 40 out of 52. So the probability of not drawing a face card would be 40 of 52. So now we have the following. The odds against would be this right here. And I think they have this backwards here. Because if this is the odds against, then it should be this. The probability of not E to the probability of event E. That's what that's supposed to be. Because this is going to be the probability of not drawing a face card. That's the 40 over 52. And then to the probability of drawing a face card would be 12 over 52. And then I would multiply both terms by 52. You'll get 40 to 12. And then divide by 4 for both terms to reduce it to 10 to 3. Okay, so what does that 10 to 3 mean? It means that for every 10 chances of drawing a non-face card, there are three chances of drawing a face card. That's what that means. Now, the next example illustrates how to convert odds to probability. So here is example 43. Patients seek care at the outpatient department of a hospital for a variety of reasons, such as medical treatment, counseling, weight management, nutrition, or asthma education. According to the National Hosp Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey for Outpatient Department Visits by CDC, the odds were 2 to 3 that a male patient visited the outpatient department for medical treatment. What is the probability that a male patient visited the out, outpatient department for medical treatment? Okay, and here it is. Will let E be the event that the randomly selected male visited the outpatient department for medical treatment, and the ratio two to three is equivalent to the probability of event E to the probability of not E. Okay, now here they equated that like this: probability of event E to the probability of not E will be equivalent to two to three. If you write it as a fraction, it would be like this. 
the probability of E over the probability of not E. That would be equal to 2 over 3. And then here they cross multiplied here. 3 times the probability of E then E equaling to 2 times the probability of not E. And the probability of not E, that's the complement that will be 1 minus the probability of then E. Okay. And then next, they uh, multiplied by 2. They distributed the 2 on the right side to get 3 times the probability of E minus, I mean, equal 2 minus 2 times the probability of E. And then they added 2 times the probability of E on both sides to get 5 times the probability of E equaling to 2. And then divided by 5 to get the probability of E is equal to 2 fifths. So the probability that a randomly selected male visited the outpatient department for medical treatment would be two-fifths, or 40%. Okay. All right, now take a look at problem number, number 21 on page 546. The probability of event A is equal to 2.42. What are the odds for A? Okay, so let's look at what we already have. We already know what the probability of event A is. That's going to be 0.42. We need to know this, the probability of not A. That's the complement, which is actually 1 minus the probability of event A occurring. And we know the probability of event A is 0.42. So 1 minus 0.42 would be... Point fifty-eight. Okay. So we're going to use that to find the odds in favor of A, or the odds for A. And that's this. The probability of event A to the probability of not A. So the probability of event A, that's 0.42. That's going to be to the probability of not A. Well, we found that out to be 0.58. And I'm going to write 0.42 as a fraction, because that's 42 hundredths. That's 42 over 100. 2, 58, 0 0.58 or 58 hundredths would be 58 over 100. And notice that we got 100 in the denominator. So what I'm going to do here is multiply both terms in that ratio by 100. So that's going to leave me with just 42 to 58. And that's because... These 100s divide out on this side and on that side of that ratio. Now I need to reduce that in simplest form by finding a number that can go into 42 and 58. And unfortunately, it'll have to be 2. So if I divide 2 into 42 and 2 into 58, this is what I would get. 42 divided by 2 would be 21 to 58 divided by 2, 29. So the odds for A would be 21 to 29. Now I added this one in this particular problem. But what are the odds against A? Well, notice I got 21 to 29. The odds against would be just switching these terms, these numbers around in their different positions. So it'd be 29 first and then 21. So the odds against would be 29 to 21. So if you find out what odds for A would be, then the odds against just switch 
the numbers around. So it'd be 29 to 21. Okay. Take a look at problem number 34 on page uh, 545. A radio station is having a contest. There is a vacation package worth $15,000. The three, three prizes are gift cards to a coffee shop worth $1,000 each and five prizes provided tutoring for your math course worth $500 each. In part A, you want to compute the expected value for this contest, assuming 10,000 people enter this contest. And part B, what are the odds for winning this vaca vacation package? Okay. So let's start with part A. We need the probability of winning the vacation package. I'm going to label this as B. Okay. So here, there's only one vacation package, and we're dealing with 10,000 people. So that probability will be 1 over 10,000. And then the probability of winning a gift card from the coffee shop. I'm just going to say the probability of C. In this case here, there are three prizes for gift cards at a coffee shop out of 10,000. So it'll be 3 over 10,000 for that probability. And then the probability for getting tutoring in the math class, there are five prizes for that. So in this case, that probability will be 5 over 10,000 because we're dealing with 10,000 people that enter that contest. Then I'm going to add one more probability, the probability of winning nothing. So in this case here, you have to think of this. There's one vacation package, three prizes, five prizes. Three plus five plus one, that's nine. And if 10,000 people enter, only nine will win something. If you subtract 10,000, Minus the 9, you'll get 9,991. That will win nothing out of 10,000. Okay. So now we're going to find the expected value here. Okay. Now... So for the expected value, this would be E is equal to the probability of winning a vacation package that's 1 over 10,000 times the amount of the uh, package, which is $15,000, plus the probability of winning a gift card that's 3 over 10,000 times the cost or the uh, value of the uh, gift card, that's $1,000. And then plus 5 over 10,000. That deals with the five prizes for tutoring. And that value is $500. So it's 5 over 10,000 times 500. And then plus... There's 9,991 over 10,000 that will receive nothing. Okay. So now let's simplify all of this. If I do 1 over 10,000 times 15,000, I'm going to get 1.5. Plus 3 over 10,000 times 1,000 would be 0.3. Plus 5 over 10,000 divided by 500, that would be point, I mean, 5 over 10,000 times 500 would be 0.25. And 9,991 times 0 is 0. 
So if we add these numbers up together, 1.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.25, and 0, this will be 2.05. So the expected value there will be 2.5, or 2, I mean 2.05, $2.05. .05, okay. So that right there is part A. Now part B, what are the odds for winning this vacation package? Okay. That means the probability of winning the vacation package is 1 over 10,000 because there's only one prize there's only one vacation package there so only one person can win so it would be 1 over 10,000 which means the probability of not winning the vacation package well if there are 10,000 people entering and only one wins how many didn't win that vacation package that's 9,999 over 10,000. That's the probability of not winning the vacation package. So now to find the odds for winning, that's going to be the probability of winning the vacation package to the probability of not winning the vacation package. So that probability there for winning the vacation package is 1 over 10,000 to the probability of not winning the vacation package, 9,999 over 10,000. And since I got that 10,000 in the denominator, I can go ahead and multiply both sides by 10,000. Well, both sides of this ratio. So here I'm going to have one left, two, 9,900. 99. And that's because these 10,000s divide out on the left of the ratio and the right of the ratio. So the odds for winning the vacation package would be 1 to 9,999. All right. Now, let's say we had this. Odds in favor and odds against, and then we want to find the probability. So here is the rule for, for converting odds to probability. If the odds in favor of E occurring are A to B, then the probability of event e, e will be A divided by A plus B. And the probability of E not occurring would be this time B divided by A plus B. So here we got the odds in favor that's A to B. Probability of E would be this, the first number, which would be your numerator in front of the colon, divided by the sum of those two numbers. That would be your denominator. And for the probability of E not occurring, then we look at the second number after the colon, which is your B. And that's divided by the sum of those two numbers. A plus B. Okay. So now let's look at an example of that. The odds are 4 to 21 that a victim of identity theft will, will incur is expenses of $5,000 to $15,000. For example, paying legal fees according to Forbes magazine. So what is the probability that, the, that a victim of identity theft incurs expenses of $5,000 to $15,000, okay? So now, so that probability would be this. That first number, which is four, that goes to your numerator, divided by the sum of those two numbers, four and 21. 
So we bring over the 4, add 4 plus 21, which will be 25. And then 4 divided by 25 times 100 would give you 16%, which means that there is a 16% chance that a victim of identity theft incurs expenses of $5,000 to $15,000. Okay. Now let's take a look at problem number 22 on page 544. The odds in favor of A are 4 to 7. So what is the probability or what is the chance that A occurs? Which means the probability. So odds in favor. That's going to be 4 to Seven. So that means the probability of event A occurring would be A divided by A plus B. So the first number is your A. That's the 4 divided by A again is 4 plus 7. So if I bring over the 4, add 4 plus 7, that would give you 11. And if I do 4 divided by 11 times 100%, this will give me approximately 36%. Okay. Okay, so that's going to conclude part 2. And it will conclude this entire section on expected value, normal distribution, and odds. Okay, so... The homework should be available for you to complete for section 9.3. As always, please feel free, feel free to email me if you have any questions about anything that's in this particular video or in the homework. Okay, so good luck with the homework and uh, take care.